Um, this is a sailplane design, and about uh, two weeks ago, uh, Dan Armstrong gave me a call and said, hey, do you want to come to the uh, ESA workshop and talk about sailplanes? And I said, yeah, I've got an idea that I've been thinking about, but uh, it's kind of in work, and uh, Dan's like, you're welcome to come and talk about this idea. So um, the uh, program comes out, and it's called uh, Sailplane Design, and uh, the actual title only came together last night when I kind of finished putting the presentation together. So um, the title is uh, A Conceptual Operation and Design of an Autonomous Dynamic Storing Cargo <laughs> Motor Glider. <laughs> so, so that's a mouthful and that's what I'm going to try to cover, cover today. Um, Bob kind of referenced this yesterday. This is the, uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect. So along the bottom here is, is wisdom. So this is when you know nothing. And this is when, you, when you're the guru, and you find that people's confidence levels are really low. This is confidence. So in the beginning, when you know nothing, you're really low. And as you know even less, you get this point here, which is called the, the peak of Mount Stupid. That's when you know very little, <laughs> but you're very, very confident about the little that you know. Um, so right now, that's kind of where this presentation is. So I'm, I'm very confident uh, of, of this, and I, I'm also cognizant, cognizant that I'm sitting at the peak of Mount, uh, Mount Stupid. <laughs> All right, so here we go. The, uh, this is a picture of the world, and uh, it is showing shipping traffic. Uh, so all these little green lines are ships moving around the world, uh, and when the lines go red, there's uh, a lot of shipping traffic. Uh, so if you look out here, this is the North America up here, and in Europe, and not in China. Uh, a bulk of all the shipping is actually just going between this is China on the other side, so across in the northern hemisphere. So there's a, a lot and a lot of ships that are busy carrying stuff between China, America, and uh, Europe, right? And some of the ships end up going around, you know, around South Africa or through the Suez Canal or come around uh, Cape Horn. But uh, the vast majority of cargo that gets moved around the world is in the northern hemisphere. So imagine you're sitting in Denver, Colorado, and you want to get yourself some package or parcel uh, from China. Uh, you have a couple of ways of doing it. You can uh, go on the ground. So you can take, it can leave China on a truck or a train, or get to a port. It'll then, uh, when it gets to the port, it'll get on a ship. It'll cross the ocean on a ship. It'll get on a truck or a train, and then it'll drive across into the middle of America, right? And then, to get that package moved, will take you between 30 and 40 days, right? But if you're in a hurry and you want your package like now, uh, you can go for air freight, in which case you can get that in a day or a couple of days, right? So you can get air freight pretty, pretty quick. Um, but obviously there's a penalty to pay. Uh, so this is a chart of cost per ton mile. So how much it costs you to move that package per mile. So obviously, you know, truck, truck rail and moving on the water is pretty cheap and air is, is pretty expensive. And that's not surprising, right? You're paying a premium for the time to get your package delivered. Right. Um, and that's obviously depending on what's important to you. Is time important or uh, is money important, right? Uh, there's another side to that, which is uh, CO2 emissions, right? So this is uh, those same modes of transport looking at CO2 emissions per ton. So to move that package per unit mass, how many CO2 uh, how much CO2 are we putting out, right? So, like, ships is pretty small, oil tank is pretty small, bulk carriers, they're, they're pretty efficient in terms of putting CO2 in the atmosphere. Trucks are, are not that great, uh, but once you get out here to air cargo, to move uh, stuff through aircraft, like cargo, not people, uh, you are putting a lot of CO2 uh, into the atmosphere. Uh, this is a, a chart that came from uh, ICAO, which is the International Civil Aviation Authority, right? And uh, on this side is the amount of CO2 that the aviation industry is putting out at the moment. And this is like a timeline of going into the future. And uh, so the top line is, if we do nothing, uh, we're putting out, uh, what's that, about 500 megatons. And then up here, it's up to, you know, uh, 2,000 megatons in 2040 if we don't do anything to our fleet, right? So there's a couple of things that the aircraft can do. Um, there's efficiencies, there's changing the aircraft technology. And then they have this big wedge here, which is kind of interesting. It's like the biggest wedge. 
uh, which is called Sustainable Alternative Fuels and Market-Based Measures, uh, which seems to be like quite a big nebulous item. Uh, but I guess the, the, the point of the slide is that we, if we do nothing, we're going to end up up here, and uh, this presentation is about you know, how to do something. So this is me, a uh, young, impressionable, lighter pilot engineer, and I'm sitting in the back of a Dewey discus on a cross-country flight, and I have this like thought, you know, like, can we move cargo more efficiently and use less CO2, right? Um, I'm, if, you look, if you look really closely, you see I'm on oxygen, so I know I'm not, not hypoxic when I have this thought, so that's a good start. So. All right, uh, this is a... This is a it on? Pardon? Was it yeah. on? Was it on? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. That was that, you just stole my last slide. All right. <laughs> um, so this is a, a historical glider pub quiz. And the, up here you can see this little token. This is a one free beer token. Uh, so uh, whoever puts up their hand first to identify the following glider. This is one picture. Any, any takers on that? Is a beer. It's a bolus. It's a bolus. There we go. Gentleman in the back, one beer for you. Yep, that is the bolus XEG7, right? So that's a cargo glider uh, from uh, World War II vintage. And uh, another one, another beer up for grabs. Anyone know what, that, what glider that is? Bernelli. Oh, I don't know who made it. It was the uh, XEG16. Was that him? Oh. I don't know who made it. But, uh, so what's interesting about this glider is it's a glider and on the front, nice big hatches and uh, what they would do is load cargo in and land in a field and I'll show you some good videos of this and then take the uh, cargo. But that is a, that is a cargo glider, right? Um, and I think I have one more. CG4. There you go, CG4. That's right. Um, <laughs> Waco. What's that? Waco. Waco did it? Yeah. Waco, yeah. Waco. Waco. <laughs> <laughs> so so here, here I am again in the glider, and this is a question like, was the valve maybe closed, right? So, I mean, can we, uh, can we use cargo gliders, ca cargo gliders to solve this problem, right? And uh, that's kind of the question that I'm asking, and I'm trying to present maybe a solution to that. Uh, as a side side product, like what happened? What happened to the cargo glider? Helicopters grew yeah. engines. So Igor Sikorsky arrived. He built the helicopter, and the cargo gliders were out of business, right? Um, in the military sense, right? Because the military could do the same thing with a helicopter. So if we're trying to do cross-country soaring, uh, these are the main sources of lift out there. We could. Uh, find a ridge, uh, we could find a shear line or convergence zone, uh, we could find thermals, we could find mountain wave, we could find stratospheric wave, polar vortex, we could try dynamic soaring. I don't know if anyone's got any other forms of cross-country soaring that we could try use. Any other forms of energy before I go on? Okay, sir. All right. It was, a, it was a sneaky beer token in there that no one got. So. <laughs> the old silver waltz where you... Into the headroom. Uh, we talked about it earlier. Yeah, dynamic soaring. That's a dynamic soaring maneuver where they yawn, where they're turning and progressing into the headwind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Number six. Yeah, that's dynamic soaring. Yeah, so I think in, inside that's dynamic, well, okay, inside dynamic soaring there's about three different kinds, like wind grade okay. soaring, gust soaring, and there's, uh, there's another one there. Um, so if I'm trying to go, if I'm trying to go across the ocean and carry some cargo, ridge lift is probably not going to work. Shear line conversion, probably not. Thermal, so there is evidence that there's thermals out in the ocean, but at night time they die, so if I'm trying to get from China to America, I'm not going to do it in one day, so then I'll end up in the ocean. Uh, mountain waves is probably not. Polar vortex and stratospheric wave, maybe. I, I don't know if we try to go over the North Pole. Um, but dynamic soaring, which uh, is a popular topic at the moment. And uh, so I, dynamic soaring. So can we use dynamic soaring to move cargo around the world? Uh, this is the Albatross, and uh, it flies literally thousands of miles, it sleeps on the wing, it locks its wings, uh, and it can fly around the world, uh, sorry, 
Yeah, it actually does go around the world, around the um, Antarctic, right? Um, so, can we use dynamic soaring to soar around the world? Um, well, for cargo, right? Uh, this is an interesting paper, paper by uh, Sachs, uh, where he was trying to discuss or try to decipher how uh, the albatross actually extracts energy. Um, and the one thing that came out of here that, that struck me was this piece about uh, wind gradient soaring, which I think is kind of different to what Paul was chatting about. But in this paper, he says that the albatross is not using wind gradient soaring, they're using a different one, which is a change in direction, which I think is the one that you're talking about. Um, I guess maybe the, the important thing is that maybe we still don't fully understand what the albatross is doing. So uh, we could use what we understand at the moment, but hopefully we'll learn better how the albatross is flying. Uh, and that could, could give us some extra energy. Um, so these are birds, and they fly around the world, that's great. But you know, can, can man gliders dynamically soar? Right? So that's the next question. And uh, fortunately for me, there was uh, a paper written by uh, Captain Randall Gordon uh, back in uh, 2006, I believe it was. Um, and this is his uh, master's dissertation thesis over Edwards Air Force Base. And uh, their project was to take the Blahnik L-13, which is what he's flying right now, and to do dynamic soaring, right? And uh, what's really cool, if I can get this right, we can go switch out this video. There's 13, that uh, they demonstrated that by using uh, what they call the hairpin maneuver, which is the uh, upwind climb and the, the downwind uh, turn, um, that yes, they could extract energy out of the atmosphere, um, but in a Blahnik L13, it wasn't, it wasn't feasible because it has a really crappy L over D, right? So uh, not the right glider, but in a man-sized glider, they actually demonstrated that you could uh, use dynamic soaring. Uh, and then I came across uh, this video. This is a visualization from NASA of the jet stream. Uh, and the jet stream is sitting, I guess there's different pieces of it, but basically there's a lot of air moving at a high altitude that goes around the whole of the northern hemisphere, right? And uh, just go to the static picture. Um, that's what, what a notion looks like on a day, and in a model version it looks something like this. So you have uh, this top, uh, let me just see which one it is. There's two of them, there's one jet stream line at the top, and then there's a mid-latitude one. Um, and the, the, the jet stream has a high wind, and it also has uh, a high wind gradient, because if you look over here, there is basically a whole lot of air that's moving. And so the question is, well, I think I get to that, maybe I'm joking here. Yeah. This is a beautiful picture uh, from the space, space shuttle that actually visualizes the jet stream, and this is where there's some cirrus cloud uh, showing the, uh, the jet stream. And so, here I'm again back in my glider, and maybe I don't have the valve on, and the question I already asked myself was like, like, hey, can we saw the jet stream, right? And fortunately, some guys have written papers on this, and uh, this paper back from uh, 2006 by uh, Sachs and Costa, uh, Dynamic soaring in the shear wind regions associated with the jet stream. Boom, like so these guys went and did, uh, in this paper they took a, an ETA or an ETA sailplane and they did the mathematical calculation to say with this high performance sailplane and the wind gradient that we see in the jet stream, would the glider be able to fly? And, you know, bang, the performance capability of modern sailplanes 
offers the possibility of dynamic sorting in these JSON regions. So that's pretty exciting. The one thing was how that paper they talk about how much shear you need, and uh, this is the shear value, which is in a uh, meteorological world of uh, per second, uh, which to make more sense in a pilot world is about one knot per 100 feet of wind shear is what the uh, ETA, ETA, ETA glider needed to actually soar in the jet stream, right? Uh, so it turns out everyone's kind of thinking about this jet stream thing, right? So this paper is coming from uh, some guys at Lehigh University, and they are looking at uh, unmanned gliders in the jet stream. So basically, you have a UAV, you put it up in the jet stream. Uh, by flying the jet stream, and in this case, they put solar panels on it and uh, extracted enough energy out of the solar panels to power all the computers and the electronics to keep the thing flying on the servo motors. And they indicated, this is obviously a little paper, that uh, aircraft capable of unpowered flying the jet stream uh, can also generate sufficient electrical power uh, to control the computers. Um, so this is an unmanned UAV kind of paper. Uh, let's get that one. So, um, the jet stream and wind shear. I went and, to see if this was real, like what does the shear look like, I went and pulled, uh, this is uh, Edwards Air Force Base. On an infrequent basis, they release a weather balloon, and you can pull that weather balloon data off the, webs off the Dryden website, and then you can plot it. And so, uh, on the x-axis, I have wind shear per second, which is the kind of meteorological way of doing it, on the top, I have knots per 100 feet, which kind of intuitively makes more sense to my brain. And on the altitude, I have uh, thousands of feet, and then the meteorology world works in kilometers, so I put that on there too. Uh, if you remember from that paper, 0 0.012 per second is the line of shear uh, that is required for the edit to fly. And uh, interestingly enough, like down here at the low altitude, there's some shear. And then up here, you know, 50 to 60,000 feet, there is shear greater than the minimum shear required for an air to So, in theory, on this day at Edwards Air Force Base, if there was an air sail plane sitting at you know 55,000 feet, we could have done dynamic soaring, right? So, uh, back to what the Earth looks like. So here I am in America, Colorado, trying to get myself a package. And if I had, uh, if I had. Uh, jet stream dynamic soaring cargo glider uh, that was flying downwind with the jet stream. It's about 8,000 odd miles, and now we're at like you know three to ten days, right? Which is not as fast as an airplane, but it's sure as hell faster than a ship. And um, it's using the jet stream, so it's using almost no energy. So we're putting like way less CO2 out of the atmosphere. So this is kind of where I'm going. Um, so who flies in the stratosphere? So the stratosphere is sitting out here. More than 10 kilometers, and so commercial jets are down here. U2 uh, flies up here. Uh, so we want to be flying in the stratosphere, which is uh, a not very hospitable place to humans. But uh, you know who's flying in there at the moment? So on the NASA side, the Global Hawk flies in those altitudes. Uh, the U2, and this is the the NASA Research ER2. And then there's another glider that's up there right now, who we just learned was how high. Yeah, so these guys are sitting at 70,000 right now. So here is a glider that is sitting at 70,000 feet. Sorry, 76,000. There's a glider at 76,000 feet right now, which is up there, right? So um, this, is all, this is all good news, I think. Uh, this is the uh, Solar Stratos, which is a team out of uh, uh, Switzerland. Uh, this is a, a conceptual video, right? So there is a, a, a touring motor glider that has solar panels on the wings, it's electric motor, and uh, I think they have, they just have one pilot and then, uh, I don't know what's sitting in the back of this aircraft. Uh, that's a conceptual drawing and that's what they try to, try to get to. And uh, last year in 2007, they flew it for the first time. So this is the first flight of that, that uh, aircraft. And uh, so it's flying, and I think they would they want to climb to the stratosphere by um, I want to say next year, 2019, 2020 time frame. They want to be soaring in the stratosphere. Uh, so obviously, if we have like a big heavy glider, um, and we want to put solar panels on the wing and have electric motors, for it to get 
from the ground to 70,000 feet, solar panels and electric motors are just not gonna, are not gonna cut it probably, right? So we need to think of ways to get it there, right? So how do we get it up to our launch altitude? And uh, this is just a, so this is a really interesting patent that I found. Uh, this is in 2016. These guys from uh, like giveaway here, Eats Germany. So that's basically uh, Airbus, right? Um, they patented this idea in 2016 of basically you have a a big something which has some means of propulsion and it's sitting on top of something else which has a means of propulsion and you fly and then they separate right and they patented this thing in 2016 and then I was like that is like the craziest thing to patent in 2016 because like that's a space shuttle and this is 1977 and that's how we did it back then so um, what's interesting is that we could take our cargo glider and strap on something else, fly up to the altitude, separate, and then you know, let the cargo glider go on and do its thing. Uh, the other way, which is what this big glider is doing right now, is uh, taking a, a tow, right? So this is the, the, the plane in front, is this is the egret, uh, which is a turbine, and that's actually a, a turbine-powered motor glider, actually, because it's taking a motor glider, I think. And funny enough, actually, if you go look, if you had to go look uh, in the, the registration, the FAA registration for that aircraft, its type is listed as glider. So we have a, a motor glider, towing a glider. Um, or uh, we could take a tow. And, and how do we, uh, I guess there's two kind of ways to do the pickup on the tow. So these guys, uh, they take the um, tow plane on the ground and the gliders on the ground and they, they take off together and climb to 40,000 feet. Uh, in World War II, they had another way of doing it and this way is kind of fun. <laughs> this is called like the glider snatch. <laughs> and uh, so here you see a glider, he's on the field, and here you see a C-47. And if you look really closely, these aren't trees, these are little poles over here and they're holding a, a loop and out the back of this guy is a hook and uh, they're going to do, I guess this is a better picture of it so yeah, glider on the ground, a couple poles, a loop, a hook, tow plane, right? so what does that look like when it happens? I'm going to uh, jump out of here and show you what that looks like this is quite fun this is a British video uh, and I can translate from, from British to American <laughs> <laughs> Not gully boats for a soccer match, but poles for a glider pickup. It's the big thrill of the Transport Command Development Unit snatching up a stationary glider. A 90-yard nylon tow rope is attached to the glider at one end and a rope between the pickup poles at the other. <laughs> Overhead, the target aircraft circles like a spatter hawk waiting to swoop. <coughs> the other hour, the glider crew climbs aboard, and the green meridite gives the come on in. And here she comes, diving down to within 15 feet of the ground. Air screws in fine pitch, and as the tug passes directly overhead, then full engine power for the snatch. <laughs> Which is smoke with friction as it runs by all hundreds of feet of cake. Only six seconds of an absence between the glider being stationary and airborne. A thousand feet up, the glider is ready to make its own way. Planning to avoid catching the tug's tail plane with a cable, the glider pilot gets the signal to cast off. So you'll notice in the beginning, I said like a cargo glider. I never said this was applicable to like humans and like passenger <laughs> kind of carrying stuff, right? So um, that's the British version. There's another version of the exact same thing. Uh, if you want to, this is the link. This is a C-47 picking up that uh, CG-4A, right? Um, but uh, this one, they actually go into the, the, the cargo glider landing in the field and how they turn around, and it's the, basically the full operation, but it's still a good video to watch, uh, and it, it's good fun, right? So, I kind of feel we coming to a point of like, what, 
what this thing should kind of look like. Um, and so this is a, a concept, a napkin sketch of what something like that would look like, right? Uh, so obviously we want a really nice low draggy structure. Um, we want to put a CG hook on it so we can tow it. We want to put some cargo pogs out on the wings. We want to spread them out so that we distribute the load uh, across mm -hmm. our wing. Um, we want to have some sort of propulsion because at some point uh, we're going to need propulsion. We can't rely purely on the jet stream. Um, we put you know, solar panels on the wings and then to distribute the load further we'll put all the batteries out on the wing tips and uh, the propellers will go for something that's foldable that can uh, fall away when we're not using them. And so like how big does this thing have to be? And I, I, I put 300 foot with a span on there, which is a pretty big chunky glider. That's like a, uh, um, how big is, uh, straight launch is like 384 feet, right? So, so yeah, it's a, it's a big, big structure, right? Um, yeah, it's Can you big. imagine the trailer? My God. Yeah, so hopefully it wouldn't be disassembled. Uh, they have a break in the wing so we could break the wings, um, perfect the wings off. And uh, Antares have got a, uh, it's on the, in the Antares, in the leading edge of the wings, they have batteries that are kind of like a big pearl string. Uh, so we could put batteries in the front there and uh, use like basically like a pearl string approach, pull a set of batteries out when it lands, put a new set of batteries, put a new batteries in, right? So that would be kind of what the glider would look like and then what an operation could look like, you would, you would set the glider up on the runway, get it all ready, then you'd just come and do the snatch maneuver, so up to 50,000 feet. You're probably not going to be uh, directly below the jet stream, so you'd have to use your solar battery power to get you to the jet, jet stream. You'd shut down that, and then you'd dynamic soar around the world, and where you want to land is probably not below the jet stream, so you put on your solar power and your uh, batteries, uh, if you're not within gliding range, you might just be in gliding range because we're at that altitude, we may be there. Uh, we get back on the ground, we fold the wings, we switch the batteries out, and uh, we take our, our cogo off, and uh, we push back out again. Um, so the, the, the one drawback is you have to keep going the same direction around the Earth, right? So the good news is that America and China are pretty much on the opposite side of the world, pretty close. And we can, uh, so yeah, we so can, going from China to America will be partially going from America to China. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Uh, so I guess what are we? Uh, that's the concept, and what are we? What are we trying to do? What's next? Um, it would be really, really nice if we could get uh, some of our friends who have aircraft that fly here to go do some research projects. So, like if the NASA Euro 2 or the Global Hawk could go and fly in the jet stream and find out some things. Also, there's the Perlan project. I don't know if we could convince them to take their glider up there. Um, but what we'd like to do is try to get some more data on the jet stream because it seems like no one's actually spent a lot of time flying there. No one's tried to done any saw there. Um, even the papers, even the UAV papers that I found, it doesn't seem like anyone's actually got a UAV in there. Everyone's just talking about doing it. No one's actually done it. Uh, so what we'd like to do is build, test, and option part of the glider to go and actually go and fly the jet stream. Um, and then we can pull the 300 foot glider and see if it works. And then at some point in the long future, like 50 years away, maybe we'll be in commercial service if we're lucky. Um, so number two, like what would, what would something like that look like? And uh, this is kind of our idea what that would look like. So if you took something like the Perlan, which someone's already done all the design work on, design cults are done, and the molds exist, so we could take the Perlan, in the back of the Perlan we could cut in uh, and put in the electric sustainer motor, and this one is straight out of the ASG32. Um, we put one pilot in the front to fly the thing. Uh, we don't want the pilot, want the pilot to fly the takeoff and the tow. So the pilot in the front will do takeoff, tow, You'll always be doing sense and avoid and ATC clearances because I don't think we totally squared away how we'd fly this with ATC. And then you'll do the landing. So the autopilot would just have to do the soaring piece. Uh, and then 
in the back seat of the pullman, we could put in a uh, batteries and processors and all those uh, all those good things. So that would be something that we could relatively quickly and easily, in inverted commas, uh, go and build to go kind of test this concept out. Which takes me to my last slide, which is me back again in the glider thinking, well, first of all, did I open the oxygen valve? So you can still have a punchline. But uh, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty crazy idea. <laughs> and uh, we should probably get a couple of folks together and, uh, and see if we can do it. Yeah, so that's like a really good question because you need, because you're going to be flying, and I don't have a picture of like coffin corner, but you're going to be flying from the stall speed to basically B and E of the glider to get the highest wind graded, right? So the spread between stall and B and E needs to be big enough that that change in kinetic energy equates to enough change in potential energy to give you enough wind shear, right? So you need a really low stall speed and a really high flutter speed, and that's, yeah, that's going to be a big problem, right? So, uh, I would hate to think of trying to put like active flutter suppression systems on, but if you need to get a high enough uh, speed range spread, then yeah, that would kind of make a, make a challenge.